is to look at an example from my company, IBM. Uh, so we have heard uh, about uh, companies that are dying, and IBM uh, is a company also that has been there for uh, over 100 years. And uh, so we will talk about a journey about how one project uh, within uh, IBM using the Agile methodology has been able to uh, transform the company. And uh, that project is uh, Watson, which you may have heard about. Uh, so, uh, IBM Research is the largest private research organization in the world, and we have, uh, over the decades, come up with what we call grand challenges. So, these grand challenges are problems that no one thinks can be solved, but we, as researchers, we think that we may try, try to crack at it. Uh, in the previous session, you heard about Big Blue, uh, Deep Blue. So this was a, a computer that was able to uh, defeat Gary Kasparov in a chess game. And then after that, once uh, after the success of that uh, project, so the new challenge that we uh, took up was Watson. And here the grand challenge was, uh, can a computer defeat a human being in a quiz contest? So that was the overall challenge. Uh, so it started as a project within IBM Research, and I will talk about the journey from uh, being the project within IBM Research to now being one of the key core uh, uh, business strategies within IBM. Okay. So the goal that we had, so the first part would be, I think, a little technical. I am from the computer science background, but I will try to uh, present the problem at a higher level, and then we will talk about how uh, that helped transform IBM. Uh, so the problem is that given a collection of documents, uh, such as World Wide Web, or maybe we have the document in a local collection, we should be able to retrieve answers to questions that are posted in natural language. That is the language we speak. Uh, so this is the problem that we are trying to solve. And why is this prob problem difficult for the computers? Uh, because the computers are very fast, uh, uh, for example, to solve uh, mathematical problems. Even the chess program, it is easy for the computer because you can consider a chess game to be an uh, algorithm. But when we look into natural language, there are a lot of disambiguities, uh, there are a lot of context that you need to know uh, before you can uh, uh, beat a human being in a chess game. And also it brings, so instead of structured information, where we say uh, that person Einstein, the birthplace is Ulm, uh, here we have to parse unstructured information. So suppose the question is, where was Einstein born? And the information may be hidden in a text where it says that one day from among his city views in Ulm, Otto chose to watercolor to send to Albert Einstein as a remembrance of Einstein's birthplace. Right? So here the answer is hidden in this passage. So you have to, from this unstructured text, figure out all the structured information to uh, answer this. And also, for example, we know that uh, percent uh, Welsh uh, ran the organization uh, General Electric. So if we have the question like if leadership is an art, then surely Jack Welch has proved himself to be a master painter in his tenure at uh, GE. So in this sentence, there is nowhere mentioned that uh, Welsh is leading G, but because of the, we know that the master painter of all the synonyms, we can figure this out that from this we can uh, get uh, the answer that we are looking for. So therefore, this shows that this problem of uh, figure, doing a question answering session and beating a human in this is a very difficult problem. So how many of you know about the Jeopardy game? Uh, so this is a quiz, con so in India, uh, we have Kon Banega Karpati, so it's a similar uh, quiz contest that is very popular in US. Uh, so what we started in the IBM research was the goal that we should be beating, uh, we should develop a system that should be beating uh, human beings in the game of Jeopardy. So Jeopardy is this quiz contest. And not only build, uh, beat any human being. So for beating a child whose knowledge may be very low, that may be easier. But what we wanted to do, we wanted to defeat past champions in the Jeopardy game. So the Jeopardy has each, each uh, episode, they have a champion. And then if you win multiple episodes, you become grand champions in Jeopardy. So the goal was that we have to beat grand champions of Jeopardy in a game of uh, quiz contest. Okay, 
so we chose uh, jeopardy because it is a huge challenge for computers to find a uh, question of uh, to such human answers and uh, so because the jeopardy is not a very ordinary quiz game so it has broad open domain you can get questions from history geography politics sports any language and another key thing is that it is a very uh, you ask the question in a very complex language and it gives the answers and then it uh, asks for the question so instead of telling uh, uh, who uh, uh, who uh, is the CEO of uh, General Electric? It will ask the question that this person is uh, running uh, the m major company in US, which is into, uh, for example, consumer electronics. And then the uh, participant have to answer it as a question, who is Jack Welch? And also because there are three participants playing that, you have to be very fast. You have to get the answer very fast because you press a buzzer. And therefore, unless you get the answer very quickly, it would be very difficult. And obviously, there are negative markings in uh, Jeopardy, so you have to have very uh, high precision and accurate conf confidence to answer that. So these were the reasons why Jeopardy was chosen, because this was a really, really hard problem. So I won't go, go into details of how we solve the problem, uh, but obviously there are a lot of uh, articles written on that. But generally what happens, how we break down this problem, suppose we are given a question, uh, so we first try to use natural la language to understand uh, the question. And then we look into our uh, offline, first we do is we collect all the documents that are there uh, in all the dimensions. And we try to analyze the document and try to get meaning from this document, get the structured information that is there in the document. And now given a question, we try to find what are the documents that possibly has the answers, okay? And then once we find the documents, the documents may be very big. We try to find segments from the document that has the possible answer. Okay? And then what we try to do is, uh, if we have five uh, un possible answers, we try to rank those answers uh, with confidence. Okay, so for this question, I think this is the answer with this much confidence. So that is very crucial because if we say that for some question we don't have the answer, it is better not to press the buzzer and try to answer the question because there is negative marking. So uh, figuring out the right answer and the confidence score for that is very uh, crucial. Okay, uh, so, so that is how we solve the problem and for that uh, we need to have, uh, it is not just natural language but we need to have uh, 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 domain knowledge of multiple area. First obviously is natural language processing because natural language processing will help us understand the question. We need knowledge of information retrieval. So this is an area of computer science where we look into a large corpus of document and try to uh, retrieve information. Uh, for example, Google search engine is a very uh, popular and famous uh, information retrieval system. And then we need to have knowledge representation and uh, reasoning. So just getting the keywords from the doc. Uh, so in Google, what you do, you can give keywords. Like, so for example, you can give general electric uh, precedent, and you may get the answer by just keyword matching. But here, the problem would be much more difficult, because here, just keyword search won't be enough. Uh, so for example, the question may be that uh, uh, this explorer uh, landed in India in 1570. And so, and so if you look into this quest answer, the question is Vasco da Gama. So you have to find uh, structures uh, uh, from the document where you have this answer. And maybe there is another document where it will say that I visited India uh, in uh, 1700. Okay, so, but that person may not be Vasco da Gama. So therefore, from all the answers to figure out the right answer takes a lot of deep analytics. And obviously, the, one of the keys was to get to the answer before all your other uh, fellow uh, contestants. And therefore, we need huge uh, speed to answer that. And therefore, we had uh, part, uh, parallel and distributed pr processing to, solve, to uh, model all the systems so that we can answer very fast.
And obviously, one of the things is when we start uh, the Watson project, it was not uh, uh, infants, it is like a first uh, child who is learning to quiz. But then we, machine learning was a key component of the system, so that if you had any uh, uh, failures, you could learn, learn from that. So initially, when we tested out Watson in, within our IBM research labs, it would uh, always fail. But we learned from those failures. We used machine learning to learn from the failures so that we could uh, uh, get better and better. And finally, uh, uh, it uh, was able to uh, uh, both uh, increase the speed as well as the precision. So this uh, system was started in 2007. And then uh, we used deep analytics. So this was the overall system where we used natural language information retrieval, uh, deep analytics, and so on. And so we learned uh, after a lot of trial and error, we got the champion level precision and co uh, confidence over a wide variety of topics. And the speed was uh, obviously we used very uh, high powerful machines so that the speed was very good. And then uh, we had the results so in 55 real time uh, sparring against former tournament and champion players. Watson put on a very competitive uh, uh, results. And finally what happened, it was a, a public uh, publicized, it was on live TV in US. Uh, so, there, so Watson played against two past champions called uh, Ken and Brad. And uh, Watson was able to defeat uh, uh, the, these two past champions in this game of Jeopardy that was telecast live in US. So this was a milestone not only for IBM, but for overall the, uh, in the previous page, uh, speaker was talking about Turing test, right? So this was a, a win of computers over humans, and this had a huge implication for the overall field of computer science. But uh, so what we thought, OK, this is good. That gave a lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, uh, advertising uh, uh, prominence to IBM, that IBM is a key player. It has a huge uh, thought leadership and so on. But that was not enough because uh, that point it was you saw companies like Nokia and all dying and IBM the major focus was on uh, systems, the major focus was on services and what we tried to do was that those were the main revenue generating area and what we generally had was we had huge data centers where customers would come, they would have all their processes we were doing there but more and more we were seeing the uh, uh, paradigm was shifting from people coming to uh, companies like IBM for outsourcing, they were using cloud, and so we were, and also companies were having a lot of data, they were trying to analyze the data. So uh, what we needed to do was to use Watson now, not only for uh, these games, but actually for getting business results. So obviously, if you look into it, uh, there are various kind of business result applications for this kind of question answering system. Uh, so, uh, healthcare and life science was the first area that we looked into. Uh, so, f uh, in this area, uh, obviously the doctors are the uh, key people who will diagnose, but the field of medical science is changing so rapidly, the doctors may not be able to keep up with all the latest literature. So, we thought that this is a field where Watson can gain a lot of knowledge, they can read all the latest literature that is going on in the medical domain. And obviously the key is not replacing the doctor, but add, add, um, aiding the doctor when they're doing the diagnostic. So that was one area uh, that we focused on. Uh, technical support is another area that we focused on. And uh, so obviously IBM has a lot of enterprise customers and their customers may come to us and tell us, so for example, that the cognitive bot kind of things, that my password is not working. So if a com uh, person comes to us with that problem, we have to first figure out what password. Is it for his internet, it is for one application, for database and so on. So tech support is another area we looked at, and that also was a huge problem because in the technical area, you can become a, a master in Oracle, but then you have to know, for example, uh, DB2 and all the other areas. So getting expertise in multiple areas was another key challenge. And there's business intelligence, government, so there are a lot of areas that uh, uh, we could use Watson, and so therefore IBM branched out and tried to see how they can utilize Watson in uh, these domains. So, 
So this has been the journey of uh, IBM Watson. It started from an IBM research project. And, uh, and then from the research project, the demonstration of the success of computers over humankind, the Jeopardy Grand Challenge, that was in uh, 2011. And then we started Watson for healthcare. Uh, we started Watson for financial service, where we use Watson to answer questions, for example, in various banks uh, for customers to ask what is, uh, for example, what is a savings account, what is the difference between savings account and current account, and so on. And then finally, currently in IBM, Watson is a major player, and we have a Watson ecosystem, which, has, uh, uh, which is uh, very intertwined with the uh, cloud paradigm. So we started, as I was telling, with the uh, medical domain. So we had about 23 million uh, uh, medical literature. So we try to put all of them into Watson, and then that has been successfully implemented in multiple hospitals around the world. In India, it has been successfully implemented in the Manipal uh, uh, medical facility. And obviously, the key is not to replace the doctor, but to act as his aid. Okay. And so uh, what we do for th this medical transformation is gain the awareness and then in, based on the knowledge that we get, then we increase the understanding using uh, machine learning, using various kind of reasoning, and then we clarify and validate. So we work with the doctors that this is the evidence we find and this is we find is the uh, cure for that. So are you validating that? The doctor may say, okay, this part may be right, this part may be wrong, and then we can go back and learn from that. So that was how uh, Watson was successfully applied in the medical domain. And then what we did was we took Watson and then we uh, pro uh, gave it to the world. Uh, so now you can go to the IBM uh, cloud paradigm and use various kind of Watson features like the Watson knowledge understanding, uh, uh, the Watson sentiment analysis, and utilize all of them in your own program. Uh, so we have this cognitive cloud infrastructure, and also we have a deep learning as a service where you can utilize techniques like deep learning for your uh, own problems. Uh, so the various kind of uh, 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 services that we have uh, in Watson, we have, uh, for example, discovery, where we can, given a corpus of document, we can analyze the document, we can figure out what are the key sentiments in the document, what are the relations that are there in the document, and you can just give a collection of document, we can do that. Uh, we can, obviously, sometimes what happens is the our mod language model is generic, but for example, if you want to tune the model to one domain, for example, if you want to tune the model to uh, uh, medical domain or you want to tune the model uh, to tech support domain, we have a knowledge studio which allows you to do that. Uh, we utilize Watson for language translator. Uh, another key uh, interesting uh, service that we have in our Watson uh, platform is personality insights, where you can give, uh, uh, for example, Facebook posts or social media interaction of a person and based on that we can tell what kind of person it is for example whether that person is optimist uh, whether he has some bias and so on and that will help you in interaction with the customers so for example if you use personality insight to get to know about a person when you interact with him using a cognitive box you may uh, be able to do it in a better way and obviously, we are now trying to expand not only from text, but visual recognition. You can uh, look into images, you can look into uh, uh, various kind of uh, videos and also try to analyze those. And of course, uh, machine learning is a key to this. Uh, so this just shows the overall platform. We have cloud at the bottom, then we have data. We have data from multiple sources. We have multiple kind of AI services and utilizing that both within IBM and outside because this is available to the public, you can build various kind of applications. Uh, so the lessons that we learned, and it has been, I think, uh, told um, multiple times before also. Uh, so we, uh, for, a com for both 
for a company as a whole as well, well as for an individual in the agile model. Don't be afraid to take up high risk challenges. Uh, so if you feel that, uh, uh, for example, Nokia, so they were stuck in the old, old views and they were not able to tune to the new challenges of app and 4G. So don't be afraid to take up high risk challenges. Uh, don't be afraid to make changes. So we need to make changes. Uh, so if you feel that your current strategy is not working, you definitely need to make changes. And obviously, both for individual as well as for a company, there is no end to learning. So currently, we may feel that deep learning and AI is the ultimate thing, but later on, maybe something new will come up, and we need to adapt to that change. Uh, so uh, uh, that's all. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Dr. Mukherjee, both for this uh, very insightful talk as well as finishing right on time. And I want to just pick up the last sentence you said, there is no end to learning. I think Watson is learning endlessly. And today it is actually about endless learning. I have one small story to share about Watson, which I thought might be interesting, from the same university that you graduated in. <clears throat> uh, there's a course on uh, artificial intelligence offered, offered by Professor Ashok Goyal, an Indian, Indian origin professor, who has a large number of students. And he decided he would use the uh, Watson AI assistant as one of the teaching assistants. And I think just for fun, they refused to tell the students who would be, which would be the TA that would be the AI assistant. So he had 15 assistants in his course. Two of them were AI bots, both based on Watson, and one was called Jill Watson. Now the challenge to the students was to figure out whether they would be able to find out who the AI bot would be. And unfortunately, the students failed. What was interesting was, he said, last year, uh, the students nominated Jill Watson as the best uh, teaching assistant for the year. And Jill Watson was not a real person. Uh, and then things got a little bit more interesting when one of the students uh, invited Jill Watson out for a date. <laughs> so without realizing that Jill Watson was really not a lady. Now that's very interesting because I think it kind of talks about not just the, the level of advancement that AI has moved to, it also talks about the challenges that we will face when um, you know, artificial and real both become real. And I think those are some of the challenges we need to look at. And that's where I think governance really plays a role. Uh, because much of this is really not about um, you know, putting laws ahead of technology, because the technology is always ahead and law is catching up. So it is more about uh, you know, maybe governance and mechanisms and uh, frameworks for ethics that will help us, uh, you know, that will guide us through this maze of somewhat, uh, I think, uh, treacherous territory that AI and new technology are taking us. And I think we could not have had a better person to talk about uh, governance and related issues <clears throat> than Professor Charu Malhotra, uh, who is a professor of e-governance and ICT at Indian Institute of Public Administration. Before we start, I want to compliment her. She just won a major award for the best paper presented at the ITO conference in Argentina. Congratulations. <clears throat> she has been working in this area for nearly 30 years and has been a trainer and a UN consultant to the UN in the field of e-governance, smart cities, and training of trainers. She has a large number of research publications in both national and international journals. Uh, she is, uh, she's guided several PhD students. I'm summarizing the uh, the resume so that you know we'll have more time for discussions. She's also very strong associations with several global institutes of excellence which work in the area of e-governance and uh, she's currently the project coordinator of a significant impact assessment and several significant capacity building projects under the prestigious Digital India program. Ladies and gentlemen, Prof Professor Dr. Charu Malhotra, thank you. When you have a chair like Professor Bose, you are stammering because he's such a, um, he's a well-known name in academia and he's such a laid-back person that you actually feel that you should not also make much fuss about your uh, program. 
Coming to Watson, sir, I was reminded of Watson of a different type. If you remember, there's a novel by Dan Brown, which has Watson as the key character, which is an artificial-led character. I think the novel is called Origin. And it ends up slaying its own creator. And that is how I got an idea of talking about ethics in artificial intelligence. It was that novel and Watson behind it. Anyway, so before I start, I would like to thank Aima for their professional conduct of this program, for inviting me and for such a wonderful audience. I would also like to thank my co-speakers for <laughs> flashing me with new ideas. So I will keep smattering this presentation which is actually, as the chair said, more about governance and more about uh, public policy making in government sectors and lesser about business organizations. But yes, government has always learned from industry and uh, in this case also it's not going to be fragile for sure. Go governance also wants to be agile for that matter. And the work has been a very long work which has got us recognition in the institute for past 30 years. So this is how I intend to go because I realize that uh, the audience might be very familiar with governance and yet a first hands-on I'll give you, give you through a small video, then we'll move to talk about frontier technologies and its impact on governance. What is the issues? These issues I've anticipated through a small case study which I conducted along with my research officers and finally answers to all the problems we've raised. So citizens' expectations of a governance are usually what I felt is roti kapra makan. These uh, photographs which you see are out of my own experience when I wanted to understand governance and I went moving in the country, almost 600 villages. I'll just take you to that journey myself through a two minute video, which will tell you what is governance all about. This is just the tip of the iceberg. If you would have gone through the video, in a flash it would indicate you that governance is more about sanity, livelihood, safety of the people, uh, food issues, clothing issues, sanitation issues, etc. Because I wanted to do away with bookish learning of governance before coming to e-governance. Broad, broadly, this is how the literature defines governance. It talks a lot about policy making. It talks a lot about uh, institutes and the rules of uh, the validity of the rules. But at the end, if you look at the lower part, governance percolates down to welfare for all and happiness for all. Within the framework which governments offer, however, governance always had targets defined by UN bodies either in terms of MDGs and now SDGs. 
SDGs, when you start demystifying these SDGs, they boil down to what I would say, sir, the local level reality. When uh, our uh, uh, co-peer from IBM was talking, was talking from the upper part healthcare as a sector. But when we look at SDGs, they talk about bottom-up approach, if I can quote C.K. Pradlath. So e-governance has to amalgamate these two things, that is pick up the bottom-up issues in terms of whatever are the concerns assailing the communities or people. Uh, at the grassroots and combine it with technology. It's so far so good because e-governance is not what we have to discuss here. If we carry on with edu-tech or gov-tech or fin-tech in the traditional form, it would collapse. We have to make it more lean and mean and that is what was ushered in by frontier technologies. Frontier technologies with their fast pace of I can say experimentation, innovation, incubation has raked changes through these three arms. These three arms pr uh, provided by Gartner in one of their research papers are actually focusing on artificial intelligence. They are focusing on the new digital platforms as well as the new form of technology which can be worn. The moment it is worn like a Fitbit which your kids wear, it starts passing on data. When it starts transmitting data, it becomes a total different avalanche which we have to confront both in organizations as well as in government sector. Because every frontier technology which you use, maybe IoT or artificial intelligence, machine learning, cloud, it's constantly sucking onto the data, capturing it from the local end and passing it on and probably creating some kind of new predictive based models. Cambridge Analytica was the first one to jolt us, to make us realize what our data is doing. It can change the destiny of the world through changing the political leadership at the country level. But coming to the brighter side of frontier technology, when my research group and I started looking into the use of frontier technology, we found it seeping in at all levels of existence. Right from combat, I met one very nice brigadier today and I've been teaching brigadiers for 30 years now. And I find that they are the first ones to be, what I can say, the, the successors and predecessors for the rest of the community to use technology. We find scientists, we find facial recognition at sector by sector. Drones are no alien to us. Even yesterday itself we talked about Zometo and drone having a handshake uh, through a startup. So frontier technology in governance is not lagging behind. And in India, India, remember, is more of a country which is, is taken as a laggard in technology implementation in governance. But we should, not, uh, we should not ignore the uptake of technology in government, which has happened in terms of using it for citizen-centric uh, decision making, in terms of its uh, capture of data for various issues, including your future wars, etc. But it will also mean capturing citizen data. World over, when we look at use of frontier technologies in governance, again, the inspiration is very interesting. So if India, which is supposed to be the brain of the rest of the world when it comes to IT, does not use technology in governance to an extensive uh, you know, extent, there has to be a reason for it. We do have silos of use of technology in governance, but we don't find that uptake at the policy making level. So what could be the reasons? The reasons are very simple. Reasons are what we expect from government is a total 180 degree change in their way of working. Because government and the rest of the policy makers which rely on maybe industry for that matter, which rely on civil society for that matter, have to now officially announce new models of participatory form of governance. We also want our governance to be more responsive to technology rather than industry because we would rather trust uh, government and governance for that matter and which leads to the need to learn, unlearn and capacity augmentation which my institute is doing a good job. So expectations from governance 
set on the tone set by developed countries and developing countries as well has put lot of pressure on governance in our country all these cases which i'm putting i'm saying all the reasons i'm putting here i'm saying in my paper also but i wanted to bring it to your notice these changes have been captured from horses mouth we've asked bureaucrats we've asked them why do they think they need more advisors technical advisors and consultants why do we need more of public private partnership and do we need to change outsourcing techniques do we need to change sls etc so one reason which literature also vouches for governance to become agile and not fragile is to avoid policy decay when government makes its policies it takes its own sweet time in terms of strategy in terms of collaboration with the citizens in terms of announcing those policies and then implementing those policies so that by the time they are announced they are rolled out we are already far behind times and frontier technology does not give us that breathing space they have such a fast uh, product cycle that governments before they even decide it's all out there on their faces hence government has to be very flexible and adaptive in wake of industrial revolution 4.0 in fact a few days ago we were talking to secretary it dr rajesh sani who's an awesome stalwart for us and he was saying charu digital india 4.0 kya hoga what will be the new face of our country when with a frontier technology so that thinking led me to create this paper and this is how i look at it uh governance will go changes at all the three levels at global level we need to be more open no boundaries let's collaborate let's learn instead of focusing on best practices which are touted to be emulated i would say let's focus on the worst practices what did not work is more important than what worked because india can't afford to make experimental glitches in terms of national level and this is what for me is agile governance is about the fast speed of policy formulation and for that now government cannot have a cotton wool existence it needs to open up to industry to stakeholders to entrepreneurs when i say stakeholders means citizens at the top etc etc and within themselves also the g amount of g2g required at national level is going to be mind boggling which probably our existing formats might not permit very happily at the local format india has done very well the uptake of e government and e governance as i call it as gov tech now just to differentiate between frontier technology in government vis-a-vis -vis the traditional forms of technology in governance is something which we are very happy but we need to look at the new models which means new policies if you would go through drone policy which i'm sure majority of us would have it has so many i won't say loopholes but so many windows which need to be plugged into and so many doors which need to be opened up why is it restricted to a particular kind of category why is it restricted to a particular kind of limit etc etc it's not that technology has its own vulnerability it is just that policy is probably not updated and hence we come to level 2 which is uh, regulatory frameworks need to be more recursive in changing more open in changing etc hence my suggestion for agile governance is i remember my guide and phd from iit delhi always used to say problems 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 never give me that solutions is what i want from my researcher hence my solution to have an agile governance is to adopt two different models of thinking which probably government will take time to understand but is opening up if we have good leaders we have to focus on each and every component which is a holistic thinking systems approach and also we need to co create with our partners when i say partners is not just industry when i say partners the biggest beneficiary of governance is citizens themselves so co creation means lot of citizen participation and lot of citizen centricity in the new models which thankfully is happening through portals like mygov maybe it needs to improve maybe mygov needs to have a more healthy feedback loop in terms of accepting the feedback and passing it back but citizens need to be informed consulted involved collaborated and finally empowered to take decision at local level 
can we do it? Yes, it's not theory. My research team came up, thanks to all of them. Heba is one of my research officers. I've got four such people who are dedicated 24 by 7. Gave me a set of tools, which I've used just two of them, which will help us in this kind of, which will help us to imbue system thinking and design thinking. One is policy labs, second is regulatory sandbox. We can go through this later in my paper as well. But it all talk about co-sharing. And the moment we do co-sharing and co-participation and focusing on components and rather than the whole system, a lot of issues will come. It goes without saying that the whole model of uh, agile governance is based on technology, the frontier technologies, and the entire frontier technology has a backbone which we don't even realize now, which is internet. So my first presumption is internet is working when I give you this paper. One day it collapses. One fine morning we get up, there's no cloud which is accessible, there is no machine learning which is talking to another, blockchain has failed because machines' nodes cannot talk to each other. What would government do in that case? They can't afford to pause and wait and wait for it to get going. That's my first concern. Last concern, you can go through the entire uh, panel yourself. Last concern, which I'm very worried about, is George Orwell's family form kind, of, uh, animal form kind of a thing. I don't want Uncle Sam watching at us all the time. I don't want datocracy, autocracy because of data control in hands of few which is hegemony of a different kind. So no British empire should peek into my data. British in quotes means anybody who has access to data. And also India has its own concerns in terms of data protection and privacy, which are being addressed through various things. So how do you handle all this spectrum of concerns? You need to establish a center of excellence now, which should be able to evolve proof of concept in government sector, as well as help us to focus on policy making, which is more, uh, which is more healthy and uh, recursive and collaborative in its approach. I firmly believe, though I don't have a startup of my own, my daughter has started one, but that's not the reason I'm putting it here. Role of startup in agile governance cannot be done away with. Government cannot venture into all experiments and innovations and incubation themselves. So we need to, uh, to, we need to nurture traditional knowledge systems, we need to nurture our traditional ways of thinking and our startups so that we can uptake technology in a faster way and proof of concept would need collaboration, formulation, intervention at every step and finally recursive monitoring and control by benchmarks established by our own country for our own performances and not international performances. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Malhotra. I think that is a really interesting talk. And I learned a new word, GovTech, because you always hear about EdTech and all other kinds of tech. I think GovTech is really interesting. Uh, and you know, one of, a couple of questions came to my mind, uh, and I think she raised them really well, that uh, one, of course, that does governments control or you know, knowledge of data, that, or you know, uh, uh, let's say insight into what people do, does it lead to, does technology lead to uh, more comfort for citizens or more control over citizens? And I think that's a really good question that we need to ask. And I want to add one or two questions to that. Again, uh, does looking at big data lead to big bias? And big bias can create serious problems in policy. And therefore, when you're looking at policy formulation, are we going to be simply driven by technology, big data? Are we also going to be driven by ground level insights, which sometimes are not actually um, you know, uh, machine learnable, to put it, to use that term. And I think the other part, uh, I think there is a big gap between knowing and doing which is again what uh, tech may not be able to fill. Uh, I finally want to kind of pick up on one more point that she said. She said, always look for solutions. And sometimes I wonder whether we should actually be looking for the right questions because, you know, we have the hammer, we are looking for nails to hammer, but, you know, we don't know what we are, what's objective. So sometimes I think this provides really big challenges. And you raised so many of those questions. I'm very grateful to you for raising those uh, very important issues. The next speaker we have is someone from a different world, uh, someone who kind of has traveled the, the world of doing, while we academics specialize in the world of
talking about it. I'm very delighted to introduce Mr. Richard Reiki, who is a board member of KPMG Dubai. He was the former CEO of KPMG India. He has over 30 years of experience in e-governance, enterprise risk management, uh, business process management, and so on. He is on the board of governors of Management and Entrepreneurship <coughs> Professional Skills Council. He is on the advisory board of the Smile India, Smile Train India, and he was earlier the vice chair of uh, vice chair of the American Chamber of uh, Commerce in India. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Richard Reiki. Professor Joes, thank you for uh, the introduction and uh, my esteemed panel members, ladies and gentlemen, I'm standing between you and lunch. Worst place to be in, um, and uh, you must be waiting that every word I speak should be reduced to the minimum. Uh, we just heard uh, two uh, very good, uh, and of course research papers are backing it, you can read it later on. Uh, two very good speakers who came and uh, put it. I've got personal experience on Watson, so I can just share one small incidence on Watson. Is uh, At KPMG, we, uh, we have partnered with Watson to uh, look at our, uh, how we can improve our auditing or uh, make it more efficient uh, and make it more obviously cheaper for the clients because we realize that if we don't do it, somebody's going to disrupt our business and somebody else, maybe Watson will start auditing. Uh, so, uh, so we better uh, learn how to disrupt our own business. Uh, so we went there, uh, 45 minutes of training the machine, because the machine has got to be trained, 70% accuracy. You can just imagine if you train this machine for longer periods of time, what results you can get. So these are real things that are there. So if we think this Watson is up in the air, it's not happening, these are all real things going into almost every field. And uh, we just heard um, uh, Professor Joes talk about VUCA. Let me give you a diff little different version of VUCA now. He spoke of VUCA, the way we understand VUCA is volatile, uncertain, complex, ambig uh, ambiguous, okay? Now let me give you, I, I read this somewhere of how we should look at VUCA again. Look at VUCA and just think about it, okay? Velocity, V for velocity, unorthodox, U for unorthodox, Collaboration, C for collaboration, and A for agility or agile. Or if you're in America, you say awesome. So uh, so depends which city you are, you can keep changing it. But I just thought I'll give a little different version of VUCA because I'll tell you why I'm saying this. Because we are living in a world which is moving into a very different... The first thing all leaders know today, they hardly know anything. It's a very uncertain world. And the uncertainties are just too much today to be able to come. You know, earlier, if um, uh, when you were leading an organization, you knew, okay, these parameters are uncertain, this was certain, so there were some ways in which you can move. Today, there is nothing that is certain. And then you still need to lead the firm, and you want to do it. In the next session, you'll hear some new things, how the new paradigm is going to be built. I don't want to take the thunder out of that session. But I think what is happening today, disruption, which was a bad word, is no more a bad word today. Disruption is the way of life. And it is not that I'm going to spoil something. It is, uh, so uh, when I went to China two, three months back, and uh, uh, Suman uh, did raise about WeChat, and I met a number of companies out there. Actually, China is one country that has implemented artificial intelligence to the core. I mean, I met an insurance company, which was uh, online, online insurance company, not a third party provider, insurance company. In three to four years, they had 430 million customers, 430 million in four years time. So this is what artificial intelligence can do. They are saying that they want to remove, there's another company which is in medical, they want to remove 70% of the patients from coming to the hospital through artificial intelligence. Because most of the patients who go there can be cured. They got a common symptoms. They can be cured using artificial. Of course, now it's a doctor sign off, but the doctor only needs one minute or less than a minute to sign off on that prescription because the machine is doing the rest of the work and giving. And if he's not cured, the patient's not cured, then they can, uh, you know, move on there. So uh, we spoke about uh, 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 Professor Charu Malhotra did speak about uh, that uh, we live in a very connected world. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I can tell you, if you've got a teenage uh, child, just go to a place where there's no internet 
and see what happens. I don't need to say further. The, either the phone will break, they will try to keep getting on the internet, because that is uh, actually connectivity has become the new oxygen. It has become the new oxygen. People, if they are not connected, they feel. And if anybody uses uh, iPhone, today they even give you the number of hours you are on the screen. So if you don't feel guilty, just look at that, and then you'll say, OK, I better put my phone down. So uh, I just thought I will get you. Uh, will, uh, technology is definitely getting cheaper. Every day, technology is getting cheaper. The adoption of technology is getting easier. <clears throat> and in this world, you cannot afford to be average. You know, earlier we said, OK, you're the middle of the path. It's fine. But in this world, if you are average, you are as good as dead. So you have to decide where do you want to be on the scale. <clears throat> and all companies are facing a serious challenge today because you have to continue your business in the current form where you are. So you have to still think what is and you also think what might be. So you're in a very uh, big dilemma of how you're going to run your business and how you're going to look at it. So I think that is very, and software is eating the world. There is no doubt about it. Software, I mean, who would have thought that all these major auto companies are going to be challenged by a software company? What is Tesla? Tesla is a software. And they have challenged all the big major autos. And you can see it the way the whole auto industry is going to go. So today they are controlling the, uh, your... Uh, the software controls runs your car, so the moving parts have been reduced to much less. And now they're taking over the battery life, and if they, get, if they crack the battery, they have cracked it. So we are moving into a very different horizon. Even a brick and mortar, who would have thought auto industry, you're sitting in your car, anybody can change it? But well, it's there, my friends. Everything in the world is going to get digitized. And uh, she spoke about governance. I think it's such an important thing. You know, I, I remember I was speaking to a few vice chancellors uh, uh, recently, and I, they were talking, how does fourth industrial revolution going to impact education? And I said, one of the biggest things that you'll have to do, you'll have to have a very serious overlay of ethics and governance as you teach the, new, the students, because that is going to be a very, very important thing, because Technology is much it being a unifier and you know getting us to do things in a very different way can also be a destroyer. And it can destroy, I mean, just imagine you get up in the morning and your banking system is down. So the cyber attack on the banking system, just what happens to that country? Or the energy system has been attacked. I mean, these and attacks are there. And just to share with you, you know, what these bots can do, if you have seen a few months back. Uh, Facebook started having bots talking to you. You thought you were talking to people and you were enjoying yourself. No, no, it was bots actually. And then the bots between themselves started talking. They developed a new language. And that language, that Facebook had to shut it down because they started talking a language which nobody could understand. So please understand technology. Don't let technology be your master. Because the day technology trumps humanization and tr trumps man, that's the end. Because then the technology will become the master. At the moment, technology is good. I always say, uh, people keep saying technology is a disruptor. I don't think technology is a disruptor. Technology is an enabler. It is the dreams that we can have with what we can do with that technology that is a disruptor. It is what we think, what the humans can think. So we have to move into a very different kind of organization. An organization that is a thinking organization. So think design is back on the table. And I, I saw it in your presentation, uh, Professor Malhotra, where you said about think design. Design thinking is back on the table today. Organizations have to, innovation is no more done in some room somewhere. Somebody goes into one room. I earlier remember organizations have this one room which was called a thinking room. People would go and think and come out and with something or oh, no, it's fine. So, but if we have to succeed, we have to change everything which we are doing. Our entire performance management system has to change because we cannot say that failure is bad. Because there will be attempts made, there will be things done which will not, uh, so I, I think that is going to be something which we are going to, having to live with. I'm, I'm saying, I'm even going to the extent that failure should be celebrated. Because it is through failures that you learn what you're going to do. So it is, uh, I'll stick my neck out here to say that. 
Cisco has predicted that there's going to be more than 200 billion connected devices over the next 10 years. And somebody said it's 200 is too less, it'll be a trillion, whatever the number is, forget about it. Even 200 billion is huge. Connected devices. So what is going to happen over the next 10 years? So what is going to happen? Imagine all devices are getting connected. So what is going to be the problem? Safety, security, and a collaborative model will have to come in. So these are all new things that we're going to look at, things that we have not looked at. So we are actually moving from a position of extreme competition, which we are today in. We compete with each other. Extreme competition to extreme collaboration. That's where we are moving. And also the other thing that is happening with this technology coming in, the country or the company that is able to adopt the new technology is going to be the winner because this is a level playing field. You cannot say that, okay, now India with the Western countries, we have got an exactly equal opportunity as anybody else in the world to become that economic superpower that we have been looking to become. And this fourth IR, along with its entire other parts of technology which are there, is, can give us, but it will be depends how you implement this technology and which country is going to adopt it. Adoption is going to be of a very fast speed. That will be very important and that, uh, so that one would have to see. <clears throat> the other things, you know, we keep hearing about these companies. I'll just give you two, three examples here. Um, Amazon, Spotify, and uh, Uber. So each of these companies only disrupted one aspect of the business. Amazon disrupted sales and delivery. If you look at everything that they have done, everything that Amazon has done has disrupted sales and delivery. Whether it was uh, first selling the books, then selling goods, then they brought in the Kindle, then they brought the drone for delivery, and then Alexa. Alexa, where you place your orders, and now you don't need to just tell Alexa, I want this, and Alexa will get it done. So everything is about sales and delivery. Then comes Spotify. Spotify came at a time earlier when Spotify, the promoter of Spotify, it failed when it first came. And then iTunes came in, and they created that whole music streaming thing, but iTunes was very expensive. And then came um, um, Spotify, which gave free um, music to everybody, and then they realized that the artists were not happy because they were not getting paid well. So they brought the premium service in. So you pay for it now. So everybody gets, everybody in the value chain gets. So the customer gets it, he gets much more music. So Spotify, so what did Spotify do? They created a revenue model for everybody in the ecosystem. So everybody's doing that. Uber was again disrupted design. And Tesla was actually, again, another thing of taking the company from uh, taking a uh, uh, software company and creating an auto, uh, taking an industry. So you can just imagine. But the biggest thing that will come in technology driven is trust. Just imagine you sitting in a plane and there's no pilot. There's no pilot in the plane. Would you want to fly in that plane? And I can tell you that machine will be much more safer than a human error will get out of that plane. But psychologically, we have to, the level of trust that we'll have to build in with this new technology come in will, is going to be very, very different. So, so I think uh, the, the point that is, go, is going to be that how are, there are, uh, the, how are companies going to deal with it? Today, if you look at companies, there are companies which are troubled. There are companies which are doing well. And there are companies which are paranoid. I'll just give you the example of one paranoid company, and that is Zara. Zara is a market leader. It's a market leader in, its, uh, in retail, in clothes, women's clothes, uh, and men's, but basically they are able to, because they are so paranoid that their speed to getting their products out to the market, I mean, so they're not resting that, oh, we're the number one company, so okay, who can you know, disrupt us? But they are bringing those designs so fast and globally move it across. So you sitting in India can get the design what Zara has got in about two weeks' time from when they've thought about it. So from the time they conceive it to the time they put it out in the market, that's what the time that they take. So I think uh, this is going to be, uh, uh, so uh, companies would need and then, you know, the companies who are well off, they think nobody can disrupt us. I can give you one example of it, GE. We just heard of a GE example uh, earlier. GE's shares are trading as junk bonds, equivalent to a junk bond today. 
It was the darling of the stock exchange. It was one of the most valued companies in the world and see where it is today. It may recover, you never know, but I'm giving you the situation as it is today. And we heard someone talking earlier in the morning of these 10 IT companies dominating the world. They are just not dominating the stock market. They have taken over our lives. Google knows exactly what you do. They have taken over our lives completely. We have become slaves to these companies. So the, the, we, Professor Malhotra was saying that we should not let this. I'm not sure whether these emperors have already come in. And uh, to what extent you'll be able to so the dominance of these IT companies is so big that they rule every WeChat we heard about in the morning session again. The WeChat, WeChat dominates the life of every Chinese. They can't live without WeChat. We have WhatsApp. What do we do with WhatsApp? Good morning, good night, good afternoon, good evening, or some these kind of messages or some other uh, rubbish which we keep sending each other. These guys are using WeChat to collaborate, to do business, to transfer money, to make payments, to do bookings. Their life is WeChat. It's on a QR code, it works. They go to anywhere, you can make it. You don't need a credit card. When we went to China and asked them, so how do people make payments? Do they use checks? They said, what is checks? We never heard of it. So life has moved on. And I think we need to move on. And I think she, she sounded the warning bell to us that if we do not move on, we'll not be... Uh, uh, you know, uh, India as a country needs to move on because it's important. And, and I think uh, uh, what is happening with most new business models, they are going to work on cost. They're going to work on cost. So th the innovation that is happening today, the first set of innovations is how do I do the same item at a, uh, how do I do the same item at a lower cost, at a lower cost and replicate it and bring it down. And the uh, so we, let's take the case of Oyo Rooms. Oyo Rooms came as uh, this thing to Airbnb. Airbnb was there, Oyo Rooms came, same model they were using. They have changed the model now completely. That is called innovation. Where you find the white space, and you say, how am I going to see, deal with this white space? So now Oyo Rooms is actually creating hotel rooms. They don't own a single, uh, they don't own a single real estate. But they, they run the maximum, I heard in China now, they have more rooms than what they have in India. And that boy, is, uh, Ritesh Agarwal is 27 or 26. I managed, I was lucky to be on a panel once with him. I was moderating a panel sitting there as I wanted to know his story. Ki how did he start? And it is, it is a fascinating story. I'll tell you if over lunch or whatever. But it's a fascinating story of this guy, what he, uh, how he's come, uh, what he's done. So I think the asset light model is going to work. And the more we have the asset light model, and I think those are the models that are going to actually succeed. And, you know, I would like to leave one more thought out here. You know, when all these industrial revolutions have come, the first, second, third, um, and we think something great is happening now. Honestly, a lot of great things have happened before. I mean, people couldn't fly. I mean, the aeroplane was the greatest innovation that way you could connect with each other that, that has happened. Industrial revolution where the steam engine came in and production started. When Ford Motors came and spoke about mass production and mass production became the order of the day, today mass production is dead. You talk of mass customization because today you have to deal with that and the biggest pivot today of everything is the customer. The customer is the center of everything. So they, all business models are looking at how do I bring my customer acquisition costs down and how I'm able to deal with my customer. So that is something that is going to, but there are going to be downsides of this. There are going to be job losses. World Bank has predicted, uh, World Economic Forum, sorry, has predicted that there are going to be 5 million jobs which are going to be lost. And those will have to get replaced with something else. Those people, you can't keep people jobless because you'll, you'll have a huge issue. You know, and also when we put models, we have to look at, uh, for example, when India put on all these metros, we followed the global model, how metros are built. You cannot follow that way. You can take a global idea, but you have to make it to the local. So for India, you needed the last mile connectivity is the biggest problem here. So people enter a metro station, how do they go? So there are no autos, there are no parking slots. So I think we have to take these global ideas and then say, how do you localize it to, I'm just giving one example here. There, are, there are got number of examples here sitting, but because of lack of time, I will not be able to uh, this thing. But 
I think the other important point which I want to leave here is that uh, uh, this whole innovation that is going to come and this whole startup, uh, she did mention about startup. I can tell you big companies to survive will need to bring startups onto the ecosystem because they will have to do their business. They cannot survive without the startup. The startups will have to be mingled into the ecosystem to bring the innovative thinking in, to bring that innovation in and to make them successful. And you see, whichever companies have done it, have succeeded and, uh, um, and uh, they, they have taken advantage of it. So I think startups, the B schools will need to change their curriculum, the way they teach people. I think that is going to be a major change that is going to come up because all these models will need to be taught. Who's going to teach these new models to the students? The B schools will, you cannot live. So uh, the big change that I'm seeing is curriculums cannot remain forever. They'll be changing very fast, almost uh, uh, this thing. And the faculty will also have to be equally trained as much as the students. And for all people sitting in this room, your journey is now lifelong learning. So if you think you have learned something and you have arrived, forget it. You have arrived only to do some small bit of work. Your learning will continue for life. And I think that is what technology is going to do. Thank you very much.